Virginie Masseneuve manages over $17 billion in various funds. She's Schroeder Investment Management's head of global equities, joins me in the studio now. And you're saying something very different, aren't you, to, to look at earnings forecasts when you're looking at investing in stocks as opposed to dividends. Why is that? Well, I think, you know, if you look over a full cycle, uh, four to five years, uh, if you can select quality companies that have earnings growth that are higher than what the market expects, so find that growth gap uh, with strong balance sheet, great management team, generally those stocks outperform. It's worked for me for the past 25 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so then let's just look a little bit in, in a little more detail at your geographical outlook, your distribution. If we just take a look at that now, uh, Virginia, you're positive on the UK uh, and Asia, excluding Japan, of course. Uh, and emerging markets in general. Uh, you are negative, though, on the US, Europe, and Japan. So I'm wondering, to me, the UK jumps out there. You're positive on the UK. Mm. Why is that? Where do you see potential here in the UK? Okay. Well, the UK uh, stock market is actually really a global marketplace. Uh, you have over 60% of the earnings of UK listed companies that come from overseas. So the UK is actually a fantastic source of uh, global stocks. So if you think of an Australian company like Rio Tinto yeah. listed in the UK, in my allocation, which is driven by the bottom up, it would come on the UK. And that's why the UK overweight uh, driven by the bottom up is, is what it is in the funds. Do, do you like commodity driven, commodity based companies right now? I still like them. I have much less of them than I used to have taken some profits but I think they're becoming attractive again I think that the demand from China uh, might be stronger than people expect and that in general clearly we had this uh, turning point because we're having a crisis of confidence in the developed world but that this whole rebalancing of high DM or developed uh, low DM developed mm. market growth high EM growth is happening and on the margin emerging markets are much more thirsty for commodities uh, well and you're confident that that demand will it remain, will remain in place yes. despite, despite overheating concerns and possible slowing growth concerns yes I for think China you think you're not concerned about that well I think what we have is prices of the stocks have adjusted well beyond what the reality of a potential slowdown is going to be and it's that gap that really uh, will make the stock react in the future. Virginia, you're negative on Europe, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you make any distinction then between the stronger so-called core countries like France, mm -hmm. Germany, uh, and then those weaker southern European countries, or do you just look at Europe as a whole, as, as one mm -hmm. block, if you like? Yes, again, you know, driven by the bottom up, I have no exposure to peripheral Europe uh, directly. Uh, in financials, I'm very cautious. I'm underweight mm. uh, financials in Europe. Uh, some of the stocks that I like are still some of the industrial companies. Why is that? Um, well, because a lot of them have their demand growth coming from uh, emerging markets. Again, it's that exposure to emerging it's that markets exposure. that you like. Now, you don't want to have too much of that, but some of those companies are going to do well. Now, in the U.S., as you've mentioned, uh, I am underweight uh, mm. U.S. equities. It's a big part of the benchmark, over 50%. Uh, but actually, U.S. industrial companies are doing quite well. What we've seen since the beginning of the crisis and actually since 2001 is a massive regain of competitiveness of the US versus mm. Europe and that is really helping some of the industrial companies in the US. So yes you are more positive on the US versus Europe. Are you confident that demand will stay in place to mm. keep those industrial companies afloat because mm. We have had a run of poor data, haven't we, out of the sure, U.S. as well, sure. and concerns about manufacturing, which has sure. very much been the engine mm. of the recovery, perhaps waning somewhat now. Yes. So within the U.S., I'm underweight the U.S. Within the U.S., I'm cautious on regional banks. Yeah. I'm cautious on the consumer. I like the industrials, and I'm still very cautious on telecom and utilities, for example. So it's really more competitiveness on a global basis and finding the best ideas you know, across the world, and U.S. competitiveness is coming back. And we can see your positions in the U.S. there on the screen. I'm just wondering, you mentioned consumer-driven companies, and we, ju we did just have Carrefour, the world's second largest retailer, of course, cutting its forecast for profit this year, saying it expects a decline mm. as well mm. on, on slumping demand in France, and they're saying that 
that's going to weigh on earnings. You don't hold Carrefour, I know no. that, but, but what do you look for when it comes mm. to investing in companies in mm. this particular industry group? That I, I think what you've had with the crisis is a further emphasis of the split between high end and low end. I like the high end, the LVMH, the Prada, for mm. example. Uh, on the low end, I like Dollar General. But companies that are in, in the middle are, the ones are really that are getting suffering. Squeezed right now. And in the case of Carrefour, as you know, the French market is very rigid. Their a pricing strategy, I think, has been a strategic mistake. They also have big exposure to Spain. And, you know, all in all, uh, the price would have to be much lower for me to be interested in the stock. We're speaking about earnings this Wednesday, and mm -hmm. you were saying that you like the luxury brands. Mm -hmm. And we did actually have Hermes reporting today, confirming its targets for mm -hmm. 2011. First half profit rose. These high-end companies across the board are doing very well, mm. aren't they? Not just in developed markets, but in emerging markets too. Yes, absolutely. With the liquidity factors that we've seen and the fact that that's sort of the, the new normal and the rebalancing of the global economy where you have a, a, a new uh, class of consumers in emerging markets which have been successful and want to have those brands, uh, those status symbols, uh, if you want, uh, end up buying BMWs, Daimler Benz, uh, Gucci, LVMH, Prada, etc., and, and are just very thirsty for the products. And I'm just wondering, what about headwinds for mm. these brands as well? Because Hermes CEO Patrick Thomas did say that he is worried about international economic instability mm. affecting his business for the rest of 2011. So mm. are they going to be able to sustain mm. this kind of performance? I think they will, but I think clearly uh, we're at a crossroad with this current crisis of confidence that we have that's mostly driven by political vacuum in, in the US and in Europe. Uh, the economy at this point is still fine in my view. Companies I talk to are doing well, but it could go one way or the other if the crisis of confidence continues. And I think that's why we're talking potentially about a QE3 uh, being put in place or at least some measure of liquidity supporting the market. That clearly would be very positive for brands, uh, for luxury brands, uh, as well as for uh, some of the other sectors like commodities, for example. As we leave August behind, I suppose some people will be glad to see the back of this month given the volatility that mm. we've seen in the markets. What are you expecting next month? What are you watching for? Mm. Well, I think volatility is going to be here for a little while. One of my um, theme is this fragmentation, my new theme in the global village where I see fragmentation line along the globalization trends, uh, economic, social, political, etc. I think September might be more of a normal month because people are back from holidays, volumes mm. might be back, but I think we should expect continued volatility as the world rebalances, uh, you know, with this new DME imbalance. Uh, and I would say the developed world uh, is healing and trying to basically absorb the high level of leverage that, that it has. But we need political leadership, particularly with the European debt uh, issues. We really need to move forward now. So when you speak about a crisis in confidence, particularly here in Europe, what would you like to see? What would put your mind at ease? I think we need to be able to move forward. And if you think of Europe, uh, there's really three major paths that we can take. We can either go on dealing with the debt in Europe uh, with a two-geared Europe, where you'd have a core Europe that would stay with the euro and a peripheral Europe that would come up with another kind of currency, a euro two, if you want. That would actually not be very good for uh, Germany and core euro because the euro would probably go up a lot. Uh, but that's an option. Uh, the other option would be to make the FSF, for example, uh, into turn it into a bank. Uh, that would be much larger, be able to have a lot of capital and maybe start nationalizing some of the bad assets mm. and go on a path of cleaning up the system for the next 10 to 15 years. And of course, the third path, uh, path is the euro bond kind of path, but then you need political will to have real fiscal integration. And I think at this point, that's probably the last two paths that I've talked about are the ones that the leaders are, are looking at. Uh, but we really need to move forward. So you were mentioning there this issue about cleaning up the region and we've seen a great deal of concern recently about the banks. Is that something that you're watching closely in September? I know that you're cautious on financials yes. in general. Do you think there is more trouble to come? 
Well, I think we have regulatory uh, issues that need to be addressed, and we clearly have a situation with a large exposure of French and German banks to peripheral Europe that needs to move forward. Um, the, 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 the system needs economic growth. Has that exposure been exaggerated somewhat? Well, you know, you're talking about over $2 trillion of German and French banks' exposure to peripheral Europe, if mm. you include, you know, Italian yeah. and Spanish banks. So this is not a small number. Wonderful to talk to you. Virginie Massenev of Schroeder you. Investment Management.